Hello, physics students. Um, just returning to chapter nine, lecture slides. Um, we left off on slide 64. <clears throat> so when we're talking about work and how it relates to force over a distance, force that, that causes something to move a certain distance, we have a force vector and we have a displacement vector. Uh, and those aren't always parallel. If they're parallel, if the force pushes something in a straight line uh, in the same direction that the force is pointing, then it's just force times distance. It's easy. But if it's, uh, if it's not parallel, then it's not quite so easy. It, again, the way I like to usually think about it is just uh, it's the component of force that is pointing in the same direction as the distance. So let's say you had what's drawn here you have this this force here and it's and it that force there pushes some object or pulls some object over that displacement vector there then what what you would need to do is get the the component of the force so let me give you a different color so this would be the component of this this blue line here is the is the overall force but the component that points in the same direction as the as the displacement would be this. Okay, so maybe let's just imagine maybe this is the x y plane. Okay, so this would be like the force in that x direction or whatever direction we're talking about. And so the way that you would do that would be, you know, if we look at this as a right triangle with this 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 blue line being the hypotenuse. I'm gonna call this I'm gonna call this F instead of A, okay? Then the force in the the component of the force that would point in the direction of displacement would be the adjacent side of this angle alpha here. So it would be that force times the cosine of alpha. That would be that. And then that would then get multiplied by that displacement vector which I'll just call it what they called it, B. So that's where we get this right here, AB cosine alpha. Um, there is one more way to do what they're calling a dot product here. Um, so let's say you have the force already broken down into its horizontal and vertical components like a uh, Let's say F is, let's say 2, negative 3, and let's say the displacement, displacement vector D is, um, let's say, um, 1, 7. Well, then you'd have to do a lot of work to figure out <clears throat> the, ang the angle between those two vectors, um, and so it would be easier to do a dot product the way that they're going that they're going to show you here in a second or maybe they already did where you do f dot d which is and this is going to come up with the same answer that this would have and the way that you do that 2 negative 3 dot 1 7 Okay, let me just show you the generic way to do a, a dot product. Let's say you got A, B, dot, C, D. That's going to be, that's going to be A times C plus B times D. All right, that is demonstrated more in this slide right here. So they wrote it here in this slide in this uh, linear combination form where, you know, A is broken down to A sub X, I, and A sub Y, J, where I is, means the X direction, basically, and J means the Y direction. So this would be the same thing as A being listed like this, A sub X, A sub Y. That, that means the exact same thing. And B is broken down in a similar way b sub x b sub y 
but it means the same thing as that b sub x i b sub y j and then so when you dot these two things together it's the two x components multiplied and the two y components multiplied and then the results of those two things added together the results of those two products being added together to get a final dot product the final answer so over here with the little example i had given That would be 2 times 1 plus negative 3 times 7, which would be 2 plus negative 21, which is uh, um, negative 19 would be the result. Um, okay, so here's just some examples of, of different results of dot products that we can expect. If the two... Um, if the, if, the, if the force and the displacement vectors point in the same exact direction, then this A dot B is just going to be the same thing as A times B, which is what I said earlier. If they point in a generally kind of same direction where, in other words, alpha is less than 90, the angle between them is an acute angle, then the dot product will be positive. If they are at a 90 degree angle, they're perpendicular, then actually that force would not cause any displacement over that displacement vector and so the dot product would be zero and cosine of 90 is zero so it would, that's, it would make that happen um, if alpha is greater than 90 it means the force and the um, displacement would point in generally different directions uh, and so the dot product would be negative in that case um, it would be a negative work done by that force so the object is moving in this direct in the in this b direction and A is kind of making it not move as fast in that direction. So A is doing negative work. It's depleting the energy uh, of that object. And, uh, and then finally, if A and B are pointing in exact opposite directions, so alpha is 180 degrees, then A dot B would be the same thing as if they were pointing in the in this exact same direction, except it would be the complete opposite uh, sign it would be a negative negative a times b okay here's an example compute the dot product of two vectors the two vectors in this figure that's very simple it would be three times four times cosine of 30 which is uh 12 cosine 30 let me try to remember cosine 30 30 root 3 over 2 12 times root 3 over 2 uh, which would be 6 root 3 which I would imagine comes out to 10.4 as a decimal approximation all right this is a slide we looked at earlier for a different kind of dot product And so another example for using that kind of dot product, we if we have A dot B right here, where A is 3, 3, and B is 4, negative 1, which is listed right here as 3i plus 3j and 4i minus j, then you would do 3 times 4 plus 3 times negative 1, which is 12 minus 3 which is uh, 9. All right, work done by a constant force. A force F acts with a constant strength and in a constant direction as a particle moves along a straight line through a displacement delta R. The work done by this force is, same thing we've said earlier, work equals the force vector dot the displacement vector, or the displacement vector is called delta R here. All right, nothing new there. Okay, calculating the work done uh, using a dot product. All right, 70 kilogram skier is gliding at 2 meters per second when he starts down a very slippery 50 meter long 10 degree slope. What is his speed at the bottom? Okay. So, um, if we draw a picture of that, 
we might draw it like this. Here's 10 degrees. Here's this object. Uh, and if I line my x and y axes up along with the slope, this is the x-axis, this is the y-axis. What are the forces acting on that object? Well, we have gravity acting straight down. And we have the normal force acting uh, perpendicular to the surface, perpendicular to the slope there. And so what we could do, uh, there's actually, there's two ways you can do this. One is using the stuff we already know. I mean, this, you can just use the dynamics uh, methods we've used before. We do the sum of the forces in the X and the sum of the forces in the Y. Some of the forces in the X won't matter because the normal force is not going to, in this case, it won't matter because it's frictionless. Now, if it wasn't frictionless, then we would also have to put in a friction force right here. Um, and the normal force would affect that friction force and change things for us. But, um, but that is uh, not going to be the case uh, in this one because it says it's very slippery, which we're going to take to mean friction is negligible. All right, um, so we would just do the sum of the forces in the Y being um, the force of gravity, but not the full force of gravity. Uh, sorry, some, sorry, I think I, I said that backwards. The sum of the forces in the Y direction won't matter. I said X, but I meant Y. The, the, the normal force won't affect anything. Now, if there was friction, it would affect things. But because there's no friction, the normal force won't really come into play here because it doesn't have any effect on the movement of this object uh, along that Y axis. Um, but the sum of the forces in the X are what will matter. And so we, get, we can get the component. Here's this 10 degree angle for the force of gravity. So you know that I like to do standard angles. So the standard angle for that force of gravity would be what? It'd be 270 minus 10, so 260. So the sum of the forces in the X would be the force of gravity times the cosine of 260. Now there's other ways you could have done it. You could have used the 10 degree angle and done some other kind of things to get the same kind of answer. Um, and then we would say that equals MA. Uh, we would be able to figure out what that is. We would know what M is, and we would then solve for A. And once we know A, then we can use our kinematics equations to find speed. All right, so you know you, you can do that. You've done it before. But this wants us to now use the work energy principle to do, uh, to do this problem. So we're going to do a similar thing using work and in, in, and uh, energy. So here's the same model. Uh, the only forces acting on it are gravity and normal force. So it's, it's not really any different. We're not doing anything different yet. All right. Still got a 260 degree angle. Okay. So, um, we're going to say uh, that the, the work done by gravity, okay, the, the thing is moving, here, here is the displacement vector, okay, the displacement vector, delta R, is 50 meters, all right, so we can, so the normal force is not going to do any work along that. Uh, line because along that displacement vector because it's at a 90 degree angle so it's not doing anything to make it go down that slope gravity however is doing something to make that happen so again we could uh, we could take the the angle between them like this which is um, 80 degrees Right, so if this is 10, and this would be 80 degrees, and we could say um, the force 
the force of gravity, which the force of gravity in this case is is mg, which is seventy times nine point eight. Okay. Uh, let me use my calculator to calculate that. Seventy times nine point eight, six eighty six. So I can say the force of gravity times delta R cosine of alpha, which in this case would be 686 times 50 cosine of 80 degrees. All right, that's one way you can, another way you can do the, the, the get the work done that way. So if I um, calculate that times 50 times cosine of 80, I get uh, 59.56, basically, joules. Now that's not the final answer, but what we're going to do is we're going to use that uh, in the work energy principle. But the work energy principle, at least as far as this chapter is concerned right now, is that the work done by external forces on an object, gravity being an external force, is equal to the change in kinetic energy for that object. Um, so if I, if I use that, that would be 59.56 equals one-half uh, m, well, let me just write it right here, one-half m v f squared minus one half m v i squared or we could factor out the one half m and just say that's v f squared minus v i squared so either way let's 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 now plug in the numbers m is 70 you could use either either of these forms of the equation uh, either one of these forms to get it, it won't matter. All right, VF is what I'm solving for. VI is 2 in this case, which we find right there. That's his initial speed when he starts down that slope. So then we just do some algebra. Uh, 5956 times 2 divided by 70. So right now I'm just getting rid of that 1 half by multiplying by 2 and dividing by 70. And I get 170.2 equals VF squared minus 4. I can then add 4. 174.2 equals VF squared. Then what? Square root both sides. And VF will be... Thirteen point two. That is the final answer. So that's another way that we can uh, do the problem now. And which way is better? I'm not sure that we can really say one way is better. It could be that one way might take a few less steps. And a lot of times it is true that the work energy principle would, might take a little less steps, maybe a little less time. So it could be good for us. Zero work situation. The figure shows a particle moving in uniform circular motion. At every point in the motion, Fs, the component of force parallel to the instantaneous displacement, is zero. So they're saying F in the S direction, the S component of force, the on a force that points in the same direction as the s axis which is the axis of movement here it's always zero because it looks like circular motion the uh, uniform circular motion that is so the force points in and the s direction points tangent to that which is a 90 degree angle to that so that that force is never doing work pointing it's never doing anything in the direction of the motion so that would mean that the the uh, the force would be doing no work there. The particle speed and hence its kinetic energy doesn't change. So the work equals the change in kinetic energy, which equals zero in this case. 
A force everywhere per perpendicular to the motion does no work. Quick check 9.8. A car on a level road turns a quarter circle counterclockwise. You learned in chapter 8 that static friction causes the centripetal acceleration. The work done by static friction is, I bet you know this pretty easily because it just explained it in the last slide, I think it would be zero. Correct. All right, right here. Consider the roller skater shown who straightens her arms and pushes off from a wall. By Newton's third law, the wall applies a force on her. Although the skater's center of mass is displaced, the palms of her hands, where the force is exerted, are not. The force acts, but the force doesn't push any physical thing through a displacement. Hence, no work is done. All right, if what that just said bothers you, you are not alone. <clears throat> it bothers me too. It bothers many a good physics student. Um, now, I, I would have to say if her center of mass moves, then the force that acts on that center of mass does do work. We know that much. All right, the work done by variable force. To calculate the work done on an object by a force that either changes in magnitude or direction as the object moves, we got to use this following formula. It's no longer just work equals force times distance. And this, you calculus two students will appreciate this. If the force is a, is a variable force, then, and, and in this case, the variation would have to happen as a function of the displacement. So a spring would be a perfect example of that. The spring does more force the more it's displaced from its equilibrium position. Uh, but you do the integral. The integral takes care of that stuff for you. So force times distance, in this case, is the same thing as force integrated over distance. Uh, with respect to distance, if you want to say it that way. We must evaluate the integral either geometrically, that means finding the area, right? Uh, or by doing the integration with algebra. All right, example 9.7, using work to find the speed of a car. Okay, let's make this bigger. Okay. A 1500 kilogram car is towed, starting from rest. This figure shows the tension force in the rope as the car travels from zero to 200. So this is force as it goes along a distance X. So obviously this force is varying, it's changing, it's not constant. Uh, as the car is pulled along the this distance of X, the tension in the uh, rope changes accordingly. So it is a function of that displacement. What is the car's speed after being pulled 200 meters? Well, we can get the work. And this is where you would need to use the work energy principle because uh, dynamics won't help us as much here. Work equals the integral of that force. We'll say x in this case because x is the, the s-axis. Uh, dx. Uh, from 0 to 200. Now we could do it algebraically if we got an equation for that force, which we could find an equation. It'd be easy. It's a linear equation. But the easier thing would be to do the, the geometric uh, interpretation of what the integral is going to find. And the integral is going to find the area between that curve and that x-axis. And we could find that area easily because it's the area of a known shape. It's a, just a triangle. So the area is going to equal um, one half base times height. So one half, 200 times 5,000. Make sure the units are all what they should be. The units for, for distance here are meters. The units for force here are newtons. So they are good, good, good units. Let's like, let's say this was centimeters and you'd have to change it to meters to get the right answer. Um, so what's that going to be? That's going to be 100 times 5,000, so 50,000. So the work done is 50,000. That's what that integral equals. 
Now, how does that help us find the speed? Same thing we said before, where work is equal to the external work on an object is equal to uh, the change in kinetic energy. So let's do it. So 50,000 equals one half m vf squared minus vi squared. So multiply. So let's plug in stuff. Fifty thousand equals one half times fifteen hundred. Uh, VF is what we're probably looking for, isn't it? Yeah. And then minus VI. VI in this case would be zero. So no worries about VI. So I just multiply by two, divide by fifteen hundred, take the square root. Um, let's do it. Hundred thousand. Divided by 1500 equals all right, square root is 8.16 meters per second. Um, guys, I realize I made a little calculation error when I typed it in my calculator. I must have missed a zero here. Um, yeah, this is 500,000, not 50,000, 500,000. So that's going to change a couple of answers here. Um, let me redo that calculation. So 500,000, now I'm going to say times 2 divided by 1,500. And then take the square root of that. 26 now. VF equals 26. Okay. Hopefully we get the idea. All right. I think I'm going to stop this video right there. And we'll continue on with another video.